Thank you very much for joining us. We have just heard from a previous witness that um, on the day of the murder of Mr. Vikremetunge, on the 8th of January 2009, um, there were five burner phones that were attributed to the Tripoli platoon of the military, Sri Lankan military intelligence that followed him. Uh, my understanding is that you have analyzed the cell phone data relating to the movement of these five burner phones and of the phone of the victim. Um, would you be able to introduce your, yourself and your work um, for the benefit of the tribunal? Yes, of course. Um, my name is Robert Tyrone Knight. I'm what they class as a cell site expert. Um, I have previously worked for telecommunications companies in the United Kingdom. I started work for British Telecom in 1979. Uh, I then transferred to the mobile side of British Telecom, a company that were then called Cellnet. They are now known as O2 Telefonica. I worked in that area for um, more or less 20 years, um, as well as working for BT and Cellnet O2. I worked for a company called T-Mobile UK, who are now known as EE. I also worked for a short period of time for a company called Ericsson's UK. They were supplying infrastructure equipment to uh, mobile telephone networks. Following my period of working in telecommunications, I um, then spent the next 20 years on and off working in what we now know as cell site analysis, which is a sort of, a sort of forensics approach to looking at telecommunications data. I've worked for various organizations, including the Forensic Science Service, uh, which was a Home Office UK based organization. I spent several years working for the Metropolitan Police Service as a cell site engineer. I've also worked for an organization called the College of Policing, um, teaching uh, cell site practice to law enforcement. I am currently working for a company called Footprint Investigations. This is a private company. I work on behalf of prosecutions and defense. Uh, I attend court on a regular basis, giving expert evidence um, in the field of cell site analysis. Could you briefly explain the methodology that you used in the analysis that you performed? Yes, before we start, would you like me to go through a basic understanding of how cell site works? I have a, a, a presentation that usually helps yes. if people don't understand the uh, principles of cell site. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Right, I'm, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, hopefully it works. Um, this is the presentation. It's very basic, but it should give you an overview of how the cell site works and then it gives you an insight into how we uh, interpret the data. Network basics. So here we have a representation of two UK networks, a company called Vodafone and EE. Uh, the principle here is that we've got one mobile phone making a call to another mobile phone. Mobile phones are technically just very low power two way radios that connect to radio masts. These radio masts are also known technically as cell sites. So, in this example, we've got say the Vodafone mobile wants to call the EE mobile. The Vodafone mobile 
detects a cell site that's going to provide it with a, a radio signal. The mobile device connects to the cell site, makes the call. The call routes via the cell site to the Vodafone core network here. The call routes by a connection between the two networks to the EE network. The EE network will send out a, a message trying to locate the mobile. The mobile sees that message, responds, and then a link is set up between the two mobiles and a voice call can be made. During that process, the networks create what we call a call data record. <clears throat> and a call data record contains several amounts of information. Uh, and at the bottom of this presentation, there is a, an example of the type of information that will appear on the call data record. Could the you first thing... Us, yeah, my question was just whether you could work us, walk us through the various um, details of that you get uh, as for every call that is made um, through um, the the towers. Yes, this is the information is uh, contained in these call data records. It's the information that I work with to come to my conclusions when I'm analysing cell site. So when we create the call, dec uh, call record by the network, the, the, the first thing you get is the date of the event. So if it's a voice call, it's the date of the voice call. You then get the time, the exact time the voice call was made. You get the calling number. So that's, in this case, it would be the Vodafone number calling the EE number. So Vodafone is the calling number. EE would be the receiving number. Also contained in the call data records is the thing called the IMMEI, which is a unique identification number of the mobile device. So each mobile telephone device has its own unique number. One of the other parameters that are contained in the call data record is the type of call. Um, at the time of this event in 2009, you would normally see voice calls and text messages. So the type of call would be a, an outgoing voice call or an incoming voice call, an outgoing text message or an incoming text message. Also, they would call the duration of the voice call mainly for billing purposes, they need to build the customer. With text messages, you do not get a duration because it's instantaneous, so there's actually no duration. One of the other parameters that um, is captured by um, the network is that each one of these cell sites has a unique cell identification number, and that will be captured on the call data record. And lastly, as an example on this slide, usually the location of the, where the cell site is, is given in the name. Uh, in the UK, it's very common for that name to be a name of a building that the uh, cell site sits on. Or it may be the district or the area in which the cell site is located. Mr. Knight, before you move on, um, could I ask you to clarify one point? We have heard from previous our previous witness that the central, the, the Mount Lavinia Police, and and subsequently the Central Investigation Division in Sri Lanka obtained the this data, the the different. Um, metadata that you, you showed us relating to these five burner phones and the victim's phone, uh, that these were obtained from the mobile phone provider. Um, and can you confirm that this is the data, the nature of the data that you received and upon which you based your analysis? Yes, uh, our company were, were uh, given uh, copies of that 
call data obtained from the mobile phone networks. Thank you. You can proceed uh, with the, your explanation on the methodology. Yes. I'll, I'll just basically skim over this one. Um, mobile phone cell sites can uh, contain all the technologies that are in existence. Uh, so as of today, there's 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. And all, all these technologies can be operating off of just one cell site. So they're all co-located in the same area as a general rule. Um, as we're moving forward, uh, 2G, 3G will slightly disappear and they'll only be 4G and 5G. So uh, uh, that what you're allowed to use is determined by what um, contract you have with your network provider. I'll just move on to the next one. Now the basics of um, what cell site you're going to connect to will depend on, generally you connect to the cell site you're nearest to because that's going to give you the best serving signal. However, the, the, there is caveats to that in that sometimes the cell site closest to you, the signal may be blocked by obstructions such as buildings or hillsides. If that is the case, then the mobile phone will seek to find a signal from the next best serving cell, which may be slightly further away. So in this example, we can see um, on the top here is a cell site on top of a building. However, Mr. Knight, I, um, if I may interrupt you, I, I think that we've we've lost your presentation. We cannot see it at the moment. I, and I okay. believe you're referring to a specific visual presentation. Yes, it's slide, slide four of my presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll, try and, I'll try again. Um, I haven't done anything, so I don't know why it's... Uh... Thank you very much. Oh, I, I, have you got it again now? Mm, not yet, no. The joys of technology. <laughs> Yes, we only saw the first slide, actually. I'm not sure why it isn't working, I'm afraid. Our technical team just signaled that you need to try to share it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. pressing the share, yeah. Um, they, they've just mentioned that you need to share it and then just not do anything anymore because I believe there, there might be something that they need to set on, on, on our side. Okay, perfect. Apparently it's, it's okay. Give us a second so that, that our judges can also um, have a look at it. Um, I believe that we have a problem with the screen that you're actually sharing. Um, we are not seeing the slide that you're referring to. Oh, oh, oh I saw it for a second. Yes, thank you very much. My apologies, thank you. Um, please feel free to carry on. Uh, can you see that now? Yes, we can. Um, so I'll just read cat, uh, if I may. Sometimes, generally, you're supposed, uh, a mobile phone will pick up a cell site that is closest to, its, to itself. However, due to radio signals being able to be blocked by buildings or other obstacles, the mobile phone may need to seek out a cell site that is some distance away. So. Though you may expect to get coverage from this cell site, but because of this building, the signal doesn't reach us, the mobile phone, so it seeks out a um, further away cell site. <clears throat> so 
So moving on, um, a mobile phone. Here we have an example of three different cell sites covering more or less the same area. The mobile phone interacts with the network to dis decide which cell site is going to give it the best serving cell coverage. And in this example, it would be 60130. This uh, screenshot here is an example of um, some specialist equipment we use to identify a, a serving cell. And what makes it the best serving cell is that uh, you get very good signal strength here. And this is very low. And that decides that this particular cell site is the strongest. However, at the same time, it will be measuring these other cell sites to see if those, if that mobile moves, whether those then become the best serving cell site. Moving on, uh, just a few examples of um, types of cell site that we uh, use in the UK, for instance, and probably similar in other countries. Uh, generally in big cities and urban areas, they are rooftop mounted. And in this example here, there's many cell site aerials. Uh, this would suggest that this location is, is used by all the major uh, networks in the UK. We have, we have four at the moment. And again, just another example of rooftop top mounted uh, cell sites. The one on the right hand side is a singular monopole, uh, usually about the size of a street lamp, and they are used to create infill in uh, urban areas where they need more capacity or there's a, a small hole in coverage. Again, just some other examples of cell sites uh, cleverly disguised as trees. Um, this is a typical um, example of a theoretical layout of how cell site would be covered by a, a network. Um, <clears throat> as this is a, a densely populated city centre area moving out into the rural area, countryside. So where there's densely populated area, there's more people, so there's more cell sites. The more cell sites you have, the smaller the coverage area of each individual cell site. In, in a very densely populated area, a typical coverage area of a cell site can be less than 250 metres, sometimes 100 to 150 metres. Uh, moving out into the rural countryside and in major roads, um, not so many people don't need so many cell sites, therefore the coverage area can be a lot further, uh, up to sometimes five, maybe more kilometres. Uh, a typical cell site is made up of three sectors. Um, in this example, sector one, cell one points north, sector two, cell two will point in a southeasterly direction, and sector three, cell three would point in a southwesterly direction. Now, each one of these cells, if it's 2G or 3G, would have their own unique identity number. So, three 2G um, technology working on this particular sector, it will have its own identity number. And the same for any 3G or 4G that would be working on this same sector. And that goes for all three sectors. So each one of these sectors for each technology would have a unique cell ID. And for each sector, they would have, that, again, their own cell ID for each of the technologies. In this example on the right hand side, this is to give you an example of typical coverage area form of a sector. As you can see, they are not uniformed, they are individual and they can be tailored depending on what the network wants that particular sector to cover, what area it needs to cover. Mr Knight, so if I can pause you there, um, yes. could you tell us a little bit more about the precision 
of the analysis. How precise is, is the data able to give you information about the location of the phones? In other words, what is the margin of error, if any? Well, it's very hard to define the margin of error when we're talking about cell site. All I can say is that when a mobile device connects to a cell site sector, we know what sector it connected to because the call data records uh, capture the cell identity at the time of the call is made. So we know that at that time, precise time, that that mobile device connected to a particular sector or a cell site. Um, if it's in an urban area, a very densely populated area, then this coverage area can be as little as 250 metres. Um, and that's all I can ever say is that when that mobile connected to that cell site, and that cell sector, it had to have been in the coverage area of that cell site. Thank you. Now, um, that's the best that we can do on yeah. that. Thank you. Could you summarise for the tribunal your main findings regarding the data that you've been provided? All right, these are the events of the 8th for the 1st. Um, so, so the first map is just to give you an understanding of the locations uh, that we're interested in on this particular day. So location A is um, what we've been told is the victim's home address. Location B is the victim's wife's home address. Um, location C is somewhere known as the suspect's home base. Location D is the victim's workplace and location E, uh, highlighted in red, is what we were told was the murder scene. Now, on the day of the murder, <clears throat> We were given call data records for the various phones of interest. Um, and on this map, in the top left hand corner, is a series of numbers in red. These were given to us and attributed as the burner phones. The, the, the number highlighted in dark blue ending in 672, I believe is the victim's phone. Could you now, clarify for us what time frame this specific shot refers to? Yes, um, at the top of the map um, there is a, a header and you can see this time period is starting at 0756 um, and ends on 0840 minutes on the 8th of the 1st 2009. So um, roughly about 24 minutes. What are so, the findings that you can read sorry, from four, this data? Right, um, what we have here, we have um, one of the burner phones here at 0756 9861. It's connected to a cell site in this area here. And this S and E indicates to me that this mobile was making or receiving a, a, a voice call. Um, the, these uh, call boxes are taken from the original call schedules and placed into a map for ease of use. So these are just an extrapolation of what the call data records contain. Um, it's just to show to show you that this is an actual an event by that mobile phone connecting to a cell site and the location of that cell site is given to us by the mobile phone network in, in uh, coordinates, usually latitude and longitude. So they're very precise. So we know exactly where the, the, the cell site is located 
And we know at 0756 that this mobile 9861 connected to that cell site. And the same goes for, for this event for, 98, for another phone, 9811. That's uh, 0803. And then we can see that the by 0818, that mobile phone is now connecting to a cell site down here, which indicates that you, the user of that mobile phone has traveled from an area in the northwest in a southeasterly direction down towards, not at, but towards this location A. There is then a further event for this mobile ending 9811 connecting to an, another cell site just a few minutes later again indicating further travel south towards location a uh, i now move on to the next map where there is uh, a time period now starts from again 0756 to 0840 on the 8th of the 1st, 2009. Um, so we have the victim's home address here. And this particular box here, this large box containing multiple entries of call data records for various burner phones. And you can also see now at 0807, there is an event, a call, a voice call from the 9672 mobile, the victim's phone. Now, what this indicates here is that all these phones, all these mobile phones are all connecting to this cell site that's located here. And what this it tells me on this name, this is called uh, DCS2, I'll give it a short version. That suggests to me that that is on sector two of this cell site, which would be either pointing in this direction or that direction. So in an easterly or southeasterly direction and would more likely provide coverage to the victim's home address. So this suggests here that the victim was at his home address and that these mobile phones end in, in various numbers of 9951, 9812, 9831, um, and 9811 were all operating in the area of the victim's home address. Could you clarify this, for us, I'm sorry, could you clarify for us whether some of these calls were between the five burner phones? Did they call each other? Yes, they were actually. I did check this before um, coming on this afternoon. Within the main call data records, I mean, I can show you if, if you require uh, further detail that all the burner phones were mainly contacting each other throughout this period. Um, so what we see here is that they're mainly static on this cell site, whether it be on the sec sector two or the, there's one event here that's sector one that's slightly suggesting some sort of slight movement. And a couple of the mobile phones move onto these cell sites, again, indicative of some sort of movement in the general area around the victim's home address. So during this period of time, um, which we've got starting here at 0756 and ending at 0840 on this site here, we have these mobiles moving around the area of the victim's home address, whilst the victim is likely um, at or near his home address at, uh, at 0807, 0830 and 0831. Moving on to the next map, we then see some movement by 
if I just go to the victim's phone first, having been operating down here at 8.31, there is then movement up this route here, as we can see by the connections to these various cell sites by the uh, victim's phone 9672, 0842 and 0847. So that would suggest that the victim has left his home address and traveled in a northerly direction uh, along this route here. And what we can also see at the same time is some of these burner phones are following a similar route by the very fact that they're connecting cell sites along that same route. Um, though they, on this map we only see three incidences of um, the victim's phone because that is all we have for this time period which is 0840 to 0854 on the 8th of the 1st. Um, and during that time period there's obviously more call records from the burner phones because they're actually calling each other. Um, so we have some of these burner phones that have been operating in and around the victim's home address following a similar path as the victim travels north and the burner phones then heading in an easterly direction towards the victim's wife's home address at location B. And if I move on to the next slide, we can see this again. We now have the victim's phone starting at 0855 and then at 0912 and 0913, connecting to this site here, which is more than likely a serving site for this location B. And what we can also see is that some of the burner phones um, have, have followed that same path. And incidentally, this particular blue phone here belongs to one, is attributed to one of the military personnel. So now, not only have we got uh, burner phones in and around the area of location B, the victim's wife's home address, we've also got a mobile phone that we've been told is attributed to one of the military personnel. So between the period of 0855 and 0920, we now have the victim's phone moving across to his wife's home address and at the same time being following a similar route, some of the burner phones plus a military personnel phone in the same general area, not necessarily at the wife's home address, but in the same general area. So moving on, we can see for the period between 0920 and 0941, that the victim's phone remains in this area, still using his phone, still likely in the area of his wife's home address, and we still have majority of the burner phones operating in and around that same address, uh, making lots of calls mainly to each other. The only burner phone that hasn't moved is this particular one that seems to remain static in the area of the victim's home address, this 9951. So, I'll speed through because uh, uh, we can always go back to these if there's any more questions and detail required. So at 0945, we can see now, sorry, I'll start here at 0941, the victim's phone is still on that particular cell site. Then at 0945, it connects to a new cell site over here, suggesting some sort of movement. And then 0949, the uh, victim's phone has moved to this cell site again, indicative of movement. So we've now got what appears to be the victim moving away from his wife's home address, heading in a west westerly direction to this water 
expanse area and that there's then similar movement for some of these burner phones as you can see within a short period of time they're connecting to the same cell site here at 0949 and up to 0952 with the victim's phone. Um, again we have a burner phone movement down here at 0952 and similarly uh, this um, mobile phone belonging to one of the military personnel has also moved from an area that was up here to an area down here which corresponds to the movement of the burn phone. Uh, moving on, uh, slightly later in the day now at 09.52 to 10.02, we can see some more movement from the victim's phone at 09.54 or 09.55. It's now moved in a southerly direction to this area here. And then by 10.01, it's gone to an area just southeast of his home address, suggesting again that the victim is uh, traveling in a south southerly direction, having previously been over here at his wife's address. And again, as you can see clearly, the, the burner phones are following in a similar Route. Moving on to the next slide, we are now in the period of 10.03 to 10.14. Uh, the victim's phone here at 10.05 and 10.10, .10, uh, suggesting that the victim may have been stationary here for a few minutes, maybe five to ten minutes, uh, going on the time of 10.05 and 10.09 connected to more or less the same site, though different sectors, or maybe stuck in traffic. Again, we can see corresponding movement of the burner phones following a similar path using the same cells in this instance here, between 10.03 and 10.13. Um, and also these cells here, which suggest that they're moving around in this general area. And then just going down to the next slide, we're now in a period of between 10.16 and 10.13. We can now see that uh, the victim's phone at 10.18 has gone past and connected to herself below his home address to the south. And then by um, 10.23, you can see here that the victim's phone is connected to um, what I believe is sector two because of this, uh, the naming convention. You can see it says DCS2. That suggests to me that it's sector two, which would be pointing down in a, probably a east or southeasterly direction. Mr. So Knight, again, um, if you'll allow me, at what time do you have the last phone call and the last geolocation in relation to the victim's mobile phone? And can you well, show us we can... where, which cell site um, it, it, it was connected to? Yes, we, well, we can see here that, as I just said, 1023, the victim is here and that coincides with the location of the murder scene. Uh, but strangely enough, at 1030 and 1031, there's two more events there, uh, which suggests it might have moved slightly north of the uh, murder scene at 10.30, 10.31. I don't know what, I can't remember what time the murder actually occurred, uh, but that's the last call there at 10.31. And as we can see, the burner phones just prior to um, 10.23 are using the same cell site as the uh, victim's phone. Again, here, they're using the same cell site as the victim's phone, indicative of these mobiles <clears throat> following a similar route as the victim down to where the murder occurred and also the location of the victim's home address. So, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Knight. Um, I believe that the panel may have some questions for you. 
Thank you. Do I have any questions? For... I have a very simple question, or maybe. I don't know what a burner phone is. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a term that's been sort of used in American films to describe a phone that can be thrown away. It's usually, uh, I, we use uh, uh, in the UK, they're usually what they call pay and go phones. They're very cheap. You can buy them in uh, shops and supermarkets. Uh, you, you pay some money to buy the phone. You then top it up with a piece of credit that allows you to use it. And if you don't want to use it anymore, you can just buy it away. Thank you. Do any other judges have any questions? No, thank you. I think you've given us a, a picture of uh, what we need to know. Thank uh, you. Is that, no, thank you.